Our following guest is a producer and current guitar player for Once a Plague. He's produced and worked with artists such as Travis Barker, Little Xan, Bones, Juice World, but also he loves death metal, and he's been known to not be afraid of combining the genres while producing new artists. As always, I hope you enjoy this conversation. Please welcome Michael Montoya, aka Morgoth Beats. Basically, I need to start a TikTok. You should, yeah. You, you should you should redirect your YouTube like video, just parts of like interviews and stuff you have that you're like, oh, let's. You can say like say you you know like with Davey or whatever when you talk to him about playing with Corn Live or whatever, just like yeah. take like thirty seconds of it or whatever and post it on TikTok and wow. just do that like once or twice a day, you know, uh, by usually. You have a lot of content that probably would, you know, because there's different sides of TikTok. There's like metal TikTok. So, really? you know, yeah, like there's like any sort of community of like anything is on that app basically now. Wow. So if you're into cooking, if you're into painting, if you're into, you know, hyper pop, if you're into pop punk, whatever, like there's a whole <laughs> like world off it on TikTok. It's pretty crazy. Well, yeah, the the app has been around long enough to where, I mean, pretty much every community and culture is pretty much probably on there, correct? Yeah, yeah, basically, where it's, it's basically, it started as, like, you know, a kind of dance, like, oriented app called Musical.ly, and then it just, like, snowballed into, like, everything. It was Musical.ly first, huh? Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, great. Was uh, it the same app? Um, or the same company. Same company. Same company, but, yeah, it's the same app. Like, Musical.ly turned into TikTok. Like they changed the name and like I see it's the same thing. That happened quick. I remember seeing people post like on like this musically thing, mm -hmm. and like I don't know where TikTok just like, fucking exploded. Yep. Yeah, yeah, it was the same. Yeah, it was the same thing. Wow. Uh, dude, when do you want? Are we starting? Do you, we we started about five we minutes started? ago. <laughs> All right, cool. <laughs> Michael, thank you for being here, man. <laughs> thank you, honor, dude. I know I know you for a long time, so it's, it's really cool to see you. Um, going from. Guitar lessons here over a decade ago, probably, to now you're killing it. It's Thank awesome, you. man. I'm, I'm proud of you. Dude, thanks, man. I appreciate it. It's awesome. Yeah, I did get guitar lessons in this room. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, it's because, like, uh, yeah, it was funny when we were talking about it, where, like, I just bought a guitar cab off Mark, which was, like, strategic. Like, we, I was thinking about it. I was like, I kind of did that because I, I, I needed a guitar cab. Yeah. But I was like, I was like, oh, I might as well meet uh, Mark and Garza because I was, like, wow. super into your band. So I was like, I was like, oh, I good. I get a cab and I get to go meet. It's the Suicide Silence cab. I was like, sure. Wow. <laughs> Did you know that it was like the cleansing cab? No, I didn't know. It, I didn't know until you guys told me. You guys told. I think you did tell me actually. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. We were just talking outside. Uh, I guess yeah. So you you bought those cabs. That I completely forgot till right now. That you told me, and uh, I'm gonna buy those cabs back. Yeah, definitely. Those cabs are on the first record, dude. Yeah, it's like, crazy. Damn. I would love to have those cabs back. Yeah. I just have one. Oh, I just have a half cab of it. Oh, Arnie is one. Yeah, I have one. Dude, sick. Yeah, it's so funny. Wow. So you're from New Mexico, right? Yeah. Uh, so I grew up, like, first um, in, like, Oceanside Vista area. Okay. So, you know, like, not that far from here. Like, North County, San Diego. Yeah. Um, And all my family's from New Mexico. I see. So when I was, like... When I was, like, 12, I moved to Taos, which is, like, a small town in northern New Mexico, like, by Colorado. Yeah. Uh, it's, like, 5,000 people small. Um, That's a pretty small town. So, yeah, like, I came from, you know, SoCal to to Taos. And then oh, I, I know that. Mm -hmm. So then I moved back to L.A. Like, that was when I think I met you, like, within, like, a few months of me living here. No, I met you, I met you originally when I was, like, 16. You guys were on tour with uh, Niall. And oh, you, wow, there was an off tour. there was an off day uh, that Niall didn't play in in Albuquerque, where uh, it was at the compound. And I remember the cleansing. I I think the cleansing had just came out. Yeah, yeah, the cleansing had just came out. So like me and all my friends who were in high school like were like crazy about it. And wow. uh, yeah, I met like you, Mark, Mitch. You know, like all y'all like 
You think we like smoked weed and shit? <laughs> <laughs> of course. Of course. And maybe I just sat back and watched. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. I definitely remember Mitch like smoking and thinking we were in Texas. It was funny. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> that place is called the Compound. Yeah, the Compound. We always talk about that venue. I'm always like, what was that venue called? Yeah, the Compound. Wow. It's a pretty cool spot too. Yeah, you know, it was, uh, I played a lot of early shows there. Yeah. From my, my high school moshy deathcore bands and all that it's pretty funny yeah yeah it was funny living in new mexico while uh i had like moved there when i knew of like the scene going on here because i had like just got into hardcore and like into heavier forms of music and stuff like around that time period where i was like oh southern california has like such a cool scene and then i just like had to leave and go <laughs> to new mexico and then yeah so as soon as I like graduated, I like moved back. I was like going back to the scene. Yeah, you never loved. You were always in the scene. Yeah, know? totally. Well, it was just like after I think right after I met you is when I started Goliath. Yeah. And uh, well, like um, me and my like friends, you know, we started Goliath, and then yeah, I did that for a while, and then I got into Winds of Plague, and that was essentially, you know, the that story was just. Because remember, we saw, like, with Goliath, we saw you guys on tour, like, a couple times randomly. We were in, like, New Orleans at the same time. Yeah. Pretty funny. It was funny. Oh, d didn't you guys, we were at an off day, right? We were at, at, like, yeah. at, like, a restaurant? Yeah. Okay, we were on Mushrooms. Yeah, I remember that. And, like, I was, I wanted to say hi to you so bad, but I was in another dimension. I think we did. <laughs> we, we sat at the same table for a while, I think. Something, yeah. Yeah. We took a picture like on the table, like you guys like laid on the table and stuff. It was funny. Yeah. Yeah. It, I was, it was like a, a mushroom tea. <laughs> and I was like, not, you know, when you're like, okay, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. I, I don't want to talk to anybody. Dude, that was so funny. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm like, dude, no. it's, it's like an old friend right there. I should go up there and hug him. I can't even process like <laughs> life, you know? Sorry about that, dude. No, it's that okay, sucks. dude. I don't even remember that that way. I remember it just being so funny that we were in the same. And then we hung out. I think we hung out that night, too, like on Bourbon Street for really? like a while. Yeah. Were you guys on tour? Yeah. We were uh, We were on tour. We were going to record an EP at uh, Audio Hammer. Mm. Dope. That's awesome. Yeah, it was cool. Um, but yeah, uh, so that was funny. And then. It was around, I think, that time when, uh, that was when I first started, like, making music with, like, John and stuff, and then that was, like, how I yeah. did the wins thing. How did you get in touch with, uh, Andrew Glover? Oh, uh, I just met him at a show, uh, and I was in recording school, so yeah. Andrew had a st home studio, and, you know, I, like... I liked some of, like, the local bands and stuff he had, like, produced. And I was a fan of Winds of Plague, too, you know, before. Yeah, of course. Uh, you know, before I joined the band, of course. But uh, so I ended up just working with Andrew at a studio, um, you know, and that was how I, like, met John and Art and all them was kind of through that. Yeah. And, you know, I guess when the time just kind of came when the the Knicks didn't want to do it anymore, uh me and John and Art and Elena had and Davy, I think Davy mentioned it, but we had started a new band that we were messing around with that was kind of like Moshi Rob Zombie ish kind of vibe or something. Sick. But that just kind of turned into just turn playing for Winds of Plague because you know why why start a new band when you know that ba band already has like a legacy and all that. Of course. So uh, yeah, yeah, it was pretty it was pretty natural, you know, like it worked out. Seems like you left a good impression on 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 the guys. Yeah, I guess so. I I mean I I know I know because me and John had probably been working on music that he had like you know it it was it was convenient it was super convenient you know it yeah. just kind of it was one of those things where it kind of made me made me realize like manifesting things you know is yeah. like super real that you can because uh, I had like I don't know if you ever do this but. Sometimes, like, when I, I'll listen to music or if I'm, like, like skating somewhere, like, listening to music or something like that, and, like, I like the song, I'll, like, picture myself playing it, Sick. like, in front of people or something. Yeah, and it's yeah, just, like, same, same. Yeah, That's it's just cool. one of those things. So I would, like, picture myself playing for, like, Winds of Plague, like, when I hear songs and stuff, just, like, for fun. Yeah, That's you know? awesome. And then it just kind of, like, that type of stuff can happen, you know, if you, like, put a lot of attention into, into something and you're, like, smart about the way you 
maneuver, you know, it can, uh, yeah, you can really manifest stuff. Yeah, in a way you were innocently visualizing something that would eventually manifest crazy. Yeah, super crazy. You know, it's like, it's it's definitely not one of those things where some people think of it as, oh, you know, you just kind of wish and then it, it happens. It's It's like a combo of, you know, like will and like work too. You have to like work for it. The work is like... The very important key part, right? <laughs> yeah, it was. It was. I was, and also it worked. It worked because I was ready for, like, that position because I had grinded super hard with my first band. You know, like with Goliath trying to like make that happen. Yeah. Because obviously, you know, at, ideally people like would like it if their first band or your project that's like your baby blows up and kind of like what happened with you. You know, like suicide. Yeah. That's the ideal like way to blow up as a band in music, but. If it doesn't work out that way, you know, sometimes you got to be realistic about it and just take the best path, you know, after that point. So it was just like, yeah, like playing for Winds of Plague would be sick, like even though it's not like my band I originally started, but still a band I'm a fan of and I like the music a lot. So, yeah. you know, that worked out really well. And then at that time, I was when I started like producing for like underground rappers and stuff like that too. How did so, that, okay, back, back up a little bit. How did that process really start like at, at what point were you okay i'm gonna start making beats and producing beats like where where did i come into the picture because i mean was that was, was that you already in in when to play was that around like the same time period yeah so i had started making beats a little before that um, oh, okay a lot of my friends uh growing up in like high school were uh, at least a few of my best friends were like producers so like my friend john who like i still live with now uh you know, he is like a hip hop producer, and my other friend oh. Gabe, who uh, you met, you met Gabe a couple of times. He passed away, but uh, yeah, he was a hip hop producer, and I would like play guitar on their beats and stuff like that. You know, so wow. and I already had a background in engineering. Like we all engineered and stuff. So just being around that like environment, you know, I was like, oh, I can make beats too. You know, and when I first started making beats. Uh, I've always had like a weird inkling of like I just want to make like everything more metal, you know, in the world. Of course, <laughs> the the way like uh, Metalocalypse is as a show is like the way I wish like the world <laughs> was, you know, like everything is yeah. just as metal as possible. <laughs> Fuck yeah! So man. even like going into like making beats, I was like, oh, I'm gonna, you know, mix, uh, like make it them really dark and metal influenced. So I started yeah. doing that and. Luckily, around that time is when uh, the first, like, early SoundCloud rap stuff, which is basically, like, alternative kids making hip-hop music. So a lot of the early hip-hop, like, artists I worked with, like, like Omen 13 is one, Bones is one, like, that I'm known for, because Bones kind of pioneered, like, what's called, like, trap metal and what's called, like, emo rap and... Uh, he kind of pioneered that stuff. So I got to produce for him and I was like a big fan of his. Yeah. But it happened. And in so interesting enough, the, the first like real placement I would say I had like that is something that people heard, you know, and that was like kind of opened my eyes really like wide to like being like, I should take this seriously was, um, this song with Omen 13 that he's from this area, like Riverside area. And oh, wow. He, he used to, uh, he used to play in a band that I got open for Goliath like back in the day, like when we would play like, you know, the house shows and stuff like that Whoa. out in here. So he became like a, you know, like a popular underground hip hop artist. And we sampled a, a Goliath song and basically just made this super metal trap version of it because he was like a, a kid coming from like the scene, you know, into making hip hop, which there's a lot of crossover, like a lot of kids who were making in bands and stuff like that ended up becoming these like alternative rap artists so like rap was getting more and more metal and because i've always been a fan i like skateboarding and stuff growing up you know you hear a lot of underground hip-hop and you hear a lot of metal and mm -hmm. hardcore so that's kind of where my yeah. and my dad is a you know my dad's like a a blues like classic rock guy you you know you've met my parents a few yeah. times so like i grew up like with sabbath and all that kind of stuff yeah but my older brother's into hip hop and was into hip hop and stuff. So I never, uh, it wasn't like it was super strategic since I was a kid. I was like, oh, I'm gonna be a pro hip hop producer. It's just 
the opportunity presented itself and I was like, yeah, like I'm, I'm going to follow the path that's working, you know? Wow. So, so the trap metal thing like that worked, that worked out. People like that. So I just kept rolling with that. And then, yeah, man, I don't know. It just kind of snowballed. Like it just became, uh, luck. I was just kind of in the right spot at the right time. You know, like I got to work with a bunch of artists that were blowing up at the time. So it, it worked out, you know, where yeah. now it's, it's cool. Like, I like I like producing multiple genres of music. I didn't I was getting bored of just doing like one thing. Yeah. Yeah, and you you were really good at understanding the trend and then getting and seeing where that's going to be in 2 years and then getting ahead of that curve. You know? Yeah, man. I just How did you do that? I've just had a weird what the like fuck? Obs- I've had a weird obsession with uh just I don't know. I just just kind of like we were talking about Finn, like, you know, Finn McKenty from the Punk Rock NBA, who we've know, known for a really long shout time. Shout out to Finn. Yeah, shout Love out to Finn. Uh, me and him were just really, ner- like, nerdy about this kind of stuff, so we would just always talk to each other about it, like, what's happening, what's going to be next and stuff. Wow. Because uh, music kind of works very cyclically, you know? Like, you can predict patterns based on what's happened before, and... Mm. I just had all these weird theories in my head that I was like, okay, so since I got a since odd future, like I think odd future and like Wayne and all them kind of being the first like dudes to bring like skating into hip hop and what comes with skate culture is the like punk and hardcore element. So wow. odd, odd future had like trash talk, like part of their group. So I was like, oh, this is like a sign of like the, these two worlds merging. And then that just dramatically like kept going in that direction where it was like, oh, now there's like these like scene kids who are making like this alternative rap kind of music basically. And it's like a mix of what, you know, kids who grew up in the 2010s, their pop music is trap music. So it makes sense that that's like the, the backdrop for all that kind of music is because that's what everyone knows. Yeah. So, So it was just like, It went from rappers wanting to like look like rock stars and like kind of embodying that like role of like looking like a punk kid, being cool, you know, being alternative, being cool. They really like embraced that a lot. So that was what drew me to it so much is because I love like alternative music and alternative culture and I want that to like thrive above all else. Like I'm kind of indifferent to it being from metal or from pop, like anything that's like cool and out there, like I support i want to support that so i'm like you know a scene kid too at heart so you know they'll they'll like never go away or like so yeah i want to see the scene kids win of course so you know people like post malone being like the biggest star in the world and he's just like a scene kid is i think a huge win you know it is and you know uh a high tide like lifts all boats type of thing so i think artists like him and like mgk and all them bringing rock music back we that should be you know strongly encouraged from the rock scene because we've had 10 years of it being not mainstream where yeah. it got like too too cool too underground too cool like you can't have you know it's it's not going to work if it's like only like a cool hipster genre like eventually that'll like fizzle out yeah. so um i just support like you know, I just supported that fusion of like rappers kind of going in that direction. So that, sorry to answer your question. Yeah. That was how, that was kind of how it was, it was like, oh, what comes with, with people start wearing band shirts and stuff like that. They start wanting to sound more like that, you know? So that's what happened. Like emo rap took over and then, uh, that's been like the popular form of music for like five or six years now, you know, at this point. Um, so it makes sense that kids who grew up their ears are now like adapted to hearing those kind of melodies and the kind of guitar playing because like alternative singing and like alternative playing is like distinct you know before hip-hop didn't really have a whole lot of that it was more the melodic side was much more from r&b yeah but the last like you know since like 2014 or 15 or so is when like the the metalcore influenced you know came in and like the scene influence came in so uh, you have some of the biggest artists in the world being like scene kids and stuff like that. So it makes sense now that it comes back because really the only thing different they're hearing is like realistic drums, you know, versus it being programmed drums. So 
the riffs are like uh, similar, you know, the same kind of thing. That's interesting. It. So it was just kind of like that. Like it was just like one trend leads to another, kind of like a snowball effect. So that was, I guessed, and that's kind of what happened, luckily. Yeah. And I'm not the only, like tons of people, like there's a whole lot of us who like were like, oh yeah, this is what's happening, you know? So yeah, we just kind of like ran with it. Yeah. It probably helped that, uh, you know, people like you and a fan were like openly communicating these these trends and things you know having uh being lucky enough to be surrounded by very smart people and and and, and going back and forth with with the with, with, with smart people you dude know? that i feel like that's like the the best thing you can do for yourself is just to like surround yourself with you know like-minded other creative people you know you know just uh people who uh People who you like, obviously, but people who, you know, mm -hmm. make you think and stuff like that. And Finn's just always kind of been that, like, for me, you know, he's always been, like, a positive role model. So, because he's kind of always been, like, a, okay, like, you know, when there's, like, everyone goes through, like, hardships and stuff like that. But Finn's always kind of been, like, the, like, buck up, you know, and just, like, get your shit done. And that's kind of been, like, a, a pretty good, like, motivator for me. That's a friend, man. Yeah, for sure. Very, very rare to find. Because, you know, like, I definitely have, like, struggled. Because, I, have, you know, I have narcolepsy and all that. So, like, that's, yeah. like, a whole thing. But uh, Finn, like, definitely gave me, like, a good mindset to, you know, like, not complain. And just, you know, like, just work hard and just keep your head down. And then eventually you'll get, like, where you want to go, you know? Yeah. Man, how, did, how does that... You, you don't have to get into it if you don't want to. But how does that condition affect you? Um... Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, so it's kind of complex, but, you know, a, a pretty, like, quick version of it. So I, it's, like, narcolepsy and cataplexy, which is basically, like, everyone knows narcolepsy is, like, the sleeping dis disorder, which it, that's what it is. Like, it's it gets more complex than it's not as simple as, like, I just fall asleep randomly. It's just kind of I go into, like, REM sleep quicker than normal people. So... It takes, like, the average person usually, like, 30 minutes or so to go into REM sleep, which is deep sleep. Yeah. It takes narcoleptic people about, like, a couple minutes. Whoa. So y you go into deep sleep fast, and you go deeper into sleep than normal. And then you come oh. out of deep sleep just as quick. So, Interesting. Uh, so it's one of those things where it affects, like, your... I get sleep paralysis, like, a lot, a lot. And, you know, there's a whole all sorts of conspiracy theories that go along with sleep paralysis and like shadow people and stuff like yeah. that. So like, that's kind of like a norm for me is uh, like sleep paralysis, but that's like the narcolepsy side of it. And then the cataplexy side of it is um, basically my brain will go into like sleep paralysis mode randomly when I experience certain strong emotions. So usually it's like laugh. If I'm like cracking up like uncontrollably, my brain will like enter into the the phase of sleep paralysis. So I could be like walking or like standing up or something. And like when you're asleep, uh, your brain shoots out neurotoxins into your muscles to like paralyze your muscles so you don't act your dreams out. So those, so my brain will be like, oh, he's asleep, but I'm not. So it'll shoot those neurotoxins into my muscles so I can like collapse randomly. And I'm awake, but, uh, I'm in like sleep paralysis like states where my mind's awake but I can't move my body. Basically. What the fuck? It's trippy. Yeah, it's super trippy. Wow. I got it like in high around like 16 or 17 or so. It took a while to like diagnose because but uh yeah, I figured it out, you know, and it could be worse. It's like it's not the worst like thing to have, you know. Well, I mean, I, fuck. I mean, I, that probably probably helps being around people that know you know you yeah you know it's uh i feel like it's actually been like a good motivator for me where because it's one of those things where when i first got diagnosed with it the doctor just bit kind of painted like a doom and gloom kind of picture like of like what your life was going to look like just kind of like don't you know don't expect to you, you're, like, really limited in what you can do because of this, you know, like, working normal jobs and stuff like that isn't really possible for people in, like, your condition. So they kind of paint, like, a doom and gloom picture. Yeah. So, you know, I just kind of was, like, I was, like, I'm not going to, like, be that person who, like, craves sympathy like that. You know, I was, like, yeah. I'm just still going to try and 
make like what I want my life to be happen. And I think because I had that, like as like a disadvantage or whatever, it kind of like put a little like fire under me a little more to work harder and to try and like work smarter, you know, to kind of like guide my way uh, or figure out this like music industry thing, you know, how to actually make music your living. Wow. So it, uh, I think, you know, as, as much of it as a negative, um, I tried to like turn it into like more of a positive, you know, you turn it into a positive straight up. Yeah. Where there's creative, there's creative, uh, benefits to it too. I feel like, because, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of like, uh, work, your brain works the best creatively in alpha state mode. Heard of that. Yeah. Where essentially like right before you fall asleep or right when you wake up, um, when your brain isn't all the way out of REM sleep, uh, you're going to an alpha kind of state. And I can like, I can like live in that, like that sort of that state a lot longer. Um, like if I just fall asleep or if I just wake up, like I have like a studio at my house, you know, and I'll just like wait and I'll just go work like while my brain's kind of in that. Wow. That kind of state, you know, where I'm, I'm not thinking as critically and I, I just ideas just kind of like flow out and what I don't overthink it. I can kind of like, like, uh, you know, I've had it long enough to where I've figured out how to like keep my brain in that kind of like place a little longer to like get more out of it, you know? And then you see, you see like, you see interesting things because when you have sleep paralysis, hallucination is a big part of it. So, uh, you know, I have now that I, I know like what's happening, um, it kind of almost becomes more of like a game or something, you know, where it's like, oh, I'm having sleep paralysis. And, you know, you just kind of like sit back and just wait for it to go away, but try and enjoy the visuals, you know, like while, while they're happening. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's intense, man. Yeah. It's, it's a trippy disorder, but, uh, yeah, you know, it's a lot of people, you know, uh, have it worse than I do. And like, there's some examples where, you know, turning around isn't really possible. You know, there's all sorts of crazy horror stories of like people getting taken to the morgue and stuff because they have a cataplexy episode and you're your uh, heart rate goes so low that like people have thought like other people are dead and then they wake crazy, crazy stuff, you know, but Oh, uh, wow. I don't, I don't have it to like that level, but yeah, it's an interesting. Damn. So, so you're able to stay in an alpha state longer than maybe your average person. So, so do you find yourself working right before you go to bed and then right when you wake up? Is that I like try a sweet to. spot? I try to. I mean, that's not always reality. A lot of, of times I have to work uh, whenever, where, like, you know, um, it's just I try and take advantage of, of the moment when I have it. And I, I know how to, like, just kind of through, like, just, like, meditating and stuff like that, just how to, like, keep. If you have narcolepsy, you before you fall asleep, um, your brain goes into, like, alpha state. So it's one of those things where it's, like, your battery dies quicker. So... As soon as my body tells me I'm going to sleep, it's like I have like a window of time to like lay down and take a nap or else I'm going to start having cataplexy where my body's just going to like turn itself off. Fuck. So, uh, so, but I, if like that's starting to happen and I'm like working on music and stuff like that, that's usually the sweet spot to where I'm like, okay, I'm going to try and like just, you know, like go in real quick and like get as much done as I can while like my brain is in, isn't make, cause I, cause I overthink ideas sometimes. Yeah. So I find like, in that sort of like mind state, it's just that goes out the window, and then I usually make my best stuff when I'm not overthinking. Wow, you that's really special when you find a way to make something that's negative and turn it into a positive. It's cool, and in, in, in a weird way, it, it's helped your career. Yeah, totally. It's uh, yeah, it's just one of those things where it's like you can, you know, I could complain all day, I can make excuses, but um. Even though, like, there's, like, hardships to it, it's still, uh, you don't have to let it decide, like, what you're going to do and what you can't do. You know, you can still, for, for like, anyone who has, like, any sort of disorder, you know. it Obviously, yeah. narcolepsy is not the worst of, there are things that really will, like, mess you, mess you up. But, yeah, um, I don't know, I just, I just found that works for me. I've just tried to be, like, just suck it up and just, you know, keep working. And plus music, music is a, is fine. Like if you make a career in music, it doesn't matter. I have narcolepsy, you know, I can, yeah. I just have to take like my sleep schedule a little more seriously than the average person. That's about it. Yeah. You kind of chose a perfect career path, <laughs> you know, I mean, you could 
pretty much, I mean, pick your own hours. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I do, yeah. So that's that's a blessing, man. Yeah, for sure. Like, like we we could kind of choose when the work and not work. Yeah, totally. You know, and the, and the downside. It's not really a downside, but do you, do you find yourself like obsessive, or like where you can't fucking turn it off? I yeah, I can feel like I can never really turn it off. Yeah, but um, I feel like I've gotten better about. I feel like I've gotten pretty good about just like not over overthinking and not getting too obsessed over like stuff and just kind of like keep writing keep rolling keep writing keep rolling yeah you know with it i've just found that that works the best for me like creatively is uh just constant you know versus working on i mean it depends like it depends what the project is or like what i'm doing essentially but mm-hmm. with like an album you know you got to you write the songs and sometimes you have to revisit those songs over and over again. Yeah. Uh, I've just found for me personally, like when I make music, that's not usually how I end up with the best ideas is I'll usually know if it's a good idea within like the first verse into like the first chorus or something like that. You know, if I, if I get that far and I'm like, Oh, this is good. Like then it's worth, you know, continuing on. If it's something that like I'm like whatever about, you know, maybe I'll just like loosely put it together and then have it at least as like so sometimes stuff you li- you don't really like that much. It will be something someone else likes a lot, you know. So yeah, uh, how how do you deal with that? Like if you're coming up with an idea and you have like your verse and chorus that maybe you're not like the most stoked on, but then you show it to someone else. Like, do you do you know that where it's like, okay, I don't like it, I don't love it, but I could see myself. I could see someone else enjoying this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, In general, with, like, my music taste, even with my own stuff, uh, sometimes I feel like maybe it's a little bit of a... I I look for the good in music before I look for the bad, like, in everything. Like, every time I I hear anything, I like something from just most styles of music I hear. I just like, love music in general. I just, like, love the the nature of sound waves like in the air, like whatever, you know, that is, I just love that. So, uh, I find that, um, I'm maybe not picky enough sometimes, you know, I'll like find the good and something, even if like something's not good about it and I need to be a little more critical, I'll still like usually end up like there first where I'm like, Oh, I love it. You know, it's not to like, I live with it for like a couple weeks or something like that where I I'll be like, all right, I have to go like, mess with this a little bit but yeah um i just like usually starting ideas and just like rolling with them because the my favorite stuff is when you like start an idea and then you get all the way through it in a quick amount of time and you go back and listen to it and you're like dang this came out like quick and good you know like right away yeah best case scenario but not always yeah realistic yeah and you kind of you kind of need to filter out okay like you gotta know when Okay, this is easy. This song came together very easy. Oh, great! But some songs you need to grind out. Yeah, for right? sure. It's it's really hard to figure out. You know, it's just worth mm-hmm. putting in the time. Yeah, exactly. That's you know? yeah. You have to because sometimes you'll end up with dead ends, and I feel like that's working harder, not smarter. You know. Yeah. Where sometimes you'll have an idea, but and you exhaust it to death, and you're probably better off just like writing a different idea. You know, that's yeah. totally different or something. So, so you uh, you find that coming up, uh, you, you think it's a good idea when it, you find a, a a good first and chorus that like that's a pretty good base. I just I've I've uh, I found that usually it depends too on like the kind of track I'm working on, especially oh, if yeah. it's a if it's like a heavy song like with for like metal if it's like a Winds of Plague song or if it's uh, for whatever like band I'm writing with. Um, usually, like I'll try and st- stick to that because metal takes so much more time to usually to craft out like something that sounds good and listenable yeah it's 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 kind of dude it's it's crazy you know it's it's kind of crazy is uh i was i was just talking about this earlier but when i first started making making beats like i know we were mentioning about this a little bit about uh how you like want your next project to flow and stuff like that but yeah with uh with hip-hop i was like amazed at the efficiency and the outcome of like how much versus how much work went into it versus what I was used to in metal where I was really like recording bands, like doing all the stuff you're supposed to just recording to a click, 
edit, like, you know, all the, yeah. going as detailed in as you go, yeah. which is why modern metal sounds so good is because of all those years of people figuring that sort of stuff out, like editing guitars and drums and all that stuff. Yeah. But when it came to making beats, it was just like, you make the beat, that's the instrumental mix, it's, it's done, you track the vocals on it, and it's just the song is done quick, you know, because you make the beat on your own, and then you bring it to the artist, and then they just record vocals over it. That comes out and gets, like, millions of views, you know, when them, it took me, like, an hour to make the beat or something like that. Wow. And then that gets, it took me no money, you know, to make the song. They'll shoot a video that costs them, like, $1,000 maybe, and then that'll, like, their revenue would be ridiculous, you know, like, from wow. when it blows up. Even, like, established artists, you know, to where I was, like, dang, like, in metalcore, <laughs> we got to, like, spend 30 k on a video. You yeah. got to go to, like, $100,000 producer. Like, all there's just a lot of a lot of stuff that is dope if mm-hmm. you can do it. But yeah. um, I, it just kind of one of those things where I was like, oh, wow, like, this kind of feels like punk-like to me where it's just like, I'm releasing music regardless of what stage I'm at. So it was just like kids basically just being like, this is the best I can do with what I got. I'm going to put it out because I like it, you know, versus being like, oh, this is just the demo. I'm going to save up, go to... They didn't give a, they didn't give a fuck. They just, like, wow. dropped the music, and that's how modern mainstream music happened was, like, that wave of kids just, like, kind of taking it back to the DIY thing. So it was, it was cool, you know? It was one of those things where I was like, oh, this is, like... This feels very, like, authentic to me because I yeah. grew up into punk, so... Like that was kind of my yeah. first love, so it was like kind of felt like that, just a different a different way, you know. Wow. So, especially with like Juice World and like when I worked with like Juice World and stuff like that, it was just one of those things where I was like, this is really cool, like cool blend of the uh, of what I love, you know, like rap and rock, basically. Yeah. How uh, how did that gig come up? Um. So me and my friend Perps, uh, he's part of Eight Oh Eight Mafia. Um, he produced a lot on that Juice World album, Death Race for Love. Um, yeah. And his good friend, Max Lord, is Juice's engineer, was Juice's engineer. And um, so me and Perps had made a bunch of these beats together. And, you know, Perps showed Juice World, and Juice World loved it. So he made a song to it. And yeah, it came out great. You know, it's like, it's, it's definitely my favorite thing I've done so far because it's one of those things where. Like that album's like Nevermind or something like that, you know, or it's like yeah. at least in utero, like type of vibe, you know, because he's, you know, who he is. And like definitely owe that dude a lot because he like, it's my first like plaque, you know, my first like getting to work on something that like has gone double platinum and like, wow, it's like a number one album and all that stuff, you know, and it's like a pivotal emo rap, you know, like a pivotal th- thing in a su- in a certain type of music you know it was like a staple of like it was like the biggest like emo rap thing to happen so it was really cool to get to like work on that and that kid you know juice was like super authentically like a kid into like metalcore and like emo and stuff like that you know so that's why he was the biggest is because his uh his influence was so authentic from both sides you know from his hip-hop side and from his rock side so wow yeah it was really cool you know like getting to getting to work with someone like that is just like best case scenario, you know? Yeah. It's crazy how long it took you to get to that moment that just kind of popped up, you know? Right. Yeah. It's I've, one thing I've, I think I've learned is that, uh, sometimes things don't happen as fast as you want them to, but it's the person that doesn't quit. That's going to get somewhere past zero, you know, like maybe it's usually, if you stick at something long enough, like something's going to happen, you know, it may, you may not get to the heights you want to get to. Like everyone wants to get to the top, of course, but yeah, you'll get past zero, you know? That's true. So it's just how much does getting past zero mean to you? You know, if you're willing to like, some people it gets handed to them, you know, some people it's not, it's not a fair, it's not like a fair system, of course, but that's like the reality of the music industry. You know, if it was a perfect scenario, it'd be all the best musicians, all the best music is what gets popular, but mm-hmm. the, it's the entertainment industry. It's not like the song contest, in, you know, industry. Like it's not, that's not all it's about. Yeah. And you had a very slow burning career. You were very patient and obviously you wanted it and you just stuck in there. You've been, 
I've been hearing your name constantly for years, and you just kept doing it. Dude, yeah, I mean, honestly, like, I feel like, especially, I loved, I loved the EP, but the cleansing, when that came out, that was like, that was like a huge North Star for me when I was a kid, where I want, like, decided what I wanted to do, like, and like the trajectory musically I wanted to take was just one of those things where I was like, you know, that came out and I was like, oh, it was like an aha moment where I was like, oh, this is amazing. So, like, I definitely owe a lot of my, honestly, too, like, Mark, Mark, when we were talking about when I first met you over here, like, gave me some of the best advice I've ever been given by anyone in music still. Um, I think maybe he got it from Phil, but I'm not sure. But he's, he was, well, you got, or you, I think both, we were talking about it, but what you guys told me was, like, if you want to have a cool band or you want to do, like, cool music, take, like, 20 or 30 of your influences, yeah. like, from all over the place and just throw Very it in true. a pot and you know, you'll come up with something cool and different versus if you want to be one type of band and you only get influences from that same subgenre and stuff like that, you're going to sound like everyone else. Yeah. Where it's like, if you, like some kid today was like, I want to start a deathcore band. My influences are Suicide Silence, Winds of Plague, Chelsea Gray and Lorna Shore. You know, I'd be like, such a bummer where I'd be like, that's, that's cool, but you're going to sound like, like that, you know, versus Mm -hmm. if you take, uh, like that that statement just went through my head like for years so and then wow. when, when i realized like to the degree you can like use that you know is crazy because i've gotten to work with so many cool artists and stuff where mm-hmm. it was like a reinforcement where it was like okay i'm gonna try and mix like three six mafia type beats with like bring me the horizon breakdowns because you know and then so all sick. sorts like just stuff like that just wild you yeah. know what seemed like wild ideas at the time and then I got to work too with issues on their last album. And those dudes are like some of the best musicians I know. And they super use that like sort of idea too, where yeah. it was like just a melting pot of, you know, all sorts of influences that on paper doesn't seem like it would make sense. Yeah. But when you hyper focus on all the ideas, you know, and like put it together, that's how you end up with something like really cool. I feel like. Wow. Like with you guys, like I feel like with you guys, especially with, like, with, when the cleansing came out, it was one of those things where it was like there was still very much like a division between which has basically evaporated between like hardcore and death metal. Yeah. You know, where maybe here that division isn't as apparent as it is in like other places in the country. Yeah. But uh, when you guys came out, it was one of those things where it was like, I think what, like Wins too, you know, as an example, like, or at least the deathcore bands that were hardcore on their sleeve a little more yeah uh it was just like a perfect storm kind of thing you know yeah to where thing but now kids are just taking that in a more dramatic way you know where it's like totally where like another dude i produced like scar lord like he does trap metal or whatever and his stuff is just like crazy you know like breakdown type guitars with crazy trap beats and like dmb all sorts of stuff all over the place so wow yeah, it's, that I felt like that was some of the best advice I've ever been given musically. That like actually was like an aha thing for me, was well, from you and Mark for sure. Wow, that's cool. Well, you took that and ran with it. <laughs> yeah, dude, for fucking her. awesome. I like this was literally like the basis of like my whole like musical idea. <laughs> she was just like, it was like, wow, that's a, like a great idea. And then when I yeah, I just started like listen. You know, I listen to like a lot of different kinds of music, and then I just like have learned to be like, oh, like take the drum groove from like this genre, and then take, you know, like the strings from this genre, and like just do the throw it in a melting pot kind of thing. You are literally like best case scenario, like someone that takes that advice and actually uses it. And another key component which you actually didn't use, you do your own thing with it. Yeah, that's the, it's key. You got to Yeah, you got to You got to do your own thing with it. And you also have to somewhat be realistic about like, depending where you do it and what you do it on, you know, and stuff like sometimes, sometimes you can, you got to know when you're in the weeds sometimes too, you know, and sure. you're just like, yeah. you're trying something that like, maybe it's cool on paper, but you're just in, it's not going, it's not going right. You know? Yeah. I feel like that can happen too. Like when you get, 
you know, too far. Like there's there's totally. the yin and yang to it for sure. There's of course. staying too safe and then there's like going like too crazy. Too too crazy. Yeah. But yeah. But that's the great thing about music is what's too crazy to someone is not too crazy to someone else. That's true. That's I mean it. I can only imagine like the personalities you've worked with. You know, you know, like the, the like, like there's probably no boundaries, which is probably so cool to work with. Yeah, it's really cool just to like, you know, work with songwriters who maybe have a totally different musical background than I do and yeah you know sometimes work with people who you find in the same kind of like world you know from the same kind of world like so a lot of a lot of kids come from the alternative scene and like end up doing pop music and stuff it's actually like super common you know it's yeah you'd be amazed at how many like huge songwriters and stuff like that are like kids from like a scene you know it's it's like uh I feel like now, especially, I don't know, I know obviously, because now I participate in it, but like, I don't know how it was then, but it seems like now, like, honestly, like alternative kids, like kind of rule the world. <laughs> yeah. Where if, you know, you only paid attention to like one specific sect of rock or something like that, it would seem like, you know, like it went away, but its influence is like, it's high fashion now at this point, even, you know? Yeah. Where you can... It's as most of the most like famous teenagers like in the world and like young kids in the world are like these like scene kids making like pop mu and like alternative music. What a trip, huh? Yeah, it's cool. It's kind of like the new metal scene, but backwards. It is. That's exactly how I describe like when people ask me like, what is trap metal? I'm just like, I'm like, one, like I, I didn't come up with a genre name. You don't get a cho choice in what totally. something you, you work on. Yeah. You know this very well. You're better off just embracing it. Absolutely. Than trying to fight it. Yeah. You know, like obviously, like both Winds of Plague and Suicide Silence have experienced the like where the people try and use like deathcore as like a, a negative turn or something like that. Yeah. But I feel like over time eventually that the wave will will crash over or people will not use it as a negative. But yeah. anyways, uh what I was saying with like the, the trap metal thing was it's uh hip hop influenced by metal versus like metal bands influenced by like hip hop. Yeah. So it's like hip hop producers and like hip hop artists and f taking inspiration from, you know, from metal. I mean, really it's like metal core, you know, and like some hardcore and new metal and stuff like that. What a full circle. Yeah. It's a super full circle. And it's the most, it's like the most popular form of heavy music going on right now. Like for sure. Like as far as new artists go. Yeah. Like the amount of like listeners, like these kids get like City Morgue, Scar Lord, Ghost Mane, you know, like yeah, it's a lot. Like this is it's heavy as fuck. Dude. And it, yeah, exactly. I feel like it's one of those things where this is one of those moments in rock where kids and adults are just like they don't, especially with the rock audience. Like yeah, a lot of the older metal purist dudes and stuff just are not stoked. But it's unfortunate. Because the ghost main is fucking good, man. Yeah, I was watching like a live video of him. Like, mm -hmm. this is what it's all about, dude. Yeah. So weird look looking kid, fucking unique music, rocking yep. the fuck out. It's heavy as fuck, my dude. Yep. This is what it's all about, man. Exactly. I feel like, yeah, he's he's a good example of just like perfect storm, you know, just perfect like, storm, huh? Perfect storm of influences, talent, yeah. all that. Where uh at the end of the day, what teenagers like is what's right, you know? Like Totally. Kids kids pick what's popular. Yeah. Like we're old enough now to where, you know, we're over the we're over the hump of like being like teenagers deciding what music is cool and what isn't, you know. Yeah. If you're if you end up being the dude who like hates everything that's new, then that's how you know like that's how you know you really only like music because you're like attached to like a time period or like a memory or something. Yeah. And that's kind of what the music gets tied up into that. You know, I feel like yeah. People, especially if you're an artist, like you're so much better off being open minded from like a um, artistic standpoint. Yeah. Than you are being like closed minded to like new stuff. Totally, totally. You, uh, you've engineered, produced, work with hip hop artists and bands. What are some big differences that you've seen between the both that you wish the bands took from the hip hop side? Oh, that's a, that's a good example. Um, you know, I feel like, I feel like the way that they go about creating music is just, there's something to it that is just really cool where 
they just kind of they you have the instrumental they show up they write to the instrumental they record it and they it's kind of done like they just like are final about it and they just go through ideas like that it's just how much music they make is just dwarfs like metal like projects that i found and same with like the way i was saying earlier like the way they approach doing their videos and stuff like that is just a lot more badass and a lot less caring about you know it's like one of those things where they're embracing like the rawness i think like that's one thing i've i've found even with like the super popular hip hop artists like the amount of like work and the amount of uh just kind of the way they like go about just kind of the careless like effortless flow of it you know where it's with metal i find it's a lot of overthinking sometimes it can be a lot, really tiring and with hip hop you just kind of fly through ideas and maybe that's because uh it's just like the nature of the genre you know maybe it's like i think there's a lot of historical aspects as hip hop just always been that way yeah but i found yeah that has been a pretty big one is also just with a good song is what's most important Absolutely. You know, versus uh, I feel like with metal, too, a lot of times, especially in our scene, I think a lot of bands just kind of like lost the narrative around the 2016 or so. For real. Oh, Mark, yeah. It was a little bit of a wandering period where all the scene metalcore bands had basically like, it, you know, obviously there are exceptions to the, like some bands murdered it the whole time. But some bands, I think, in trying to make their music more commercial lost the narrative and like lost all the stuff that was dope about them originally and kind of bands that were charting like top 10 you know then it went that went that went away as soon as everyone started trying to go like you know active rock essentially interesting huh as soon as everyone tried to get more commercial the fan base got disinterested it seems like how to, bizarre to where it like forked and then but I also think that's the product of how you got bands like Knock Loose and Code Orange, yeah, who are essentially beat down hardcore bands, just dominating. You know, like doing. And on paper, it's like their bands are much more extreme, much more heavy. Yeah. But almost in the same way, you guys were like, a, I feel like partially a reaction to uh, the new wave of American heavy metal getting a little more rocky a little more commercial then comes That's like true. suicide right. silence you know with the cleansing and it's just like the heaviest rawest album ever that just you know when everyone else was kind of like softening up i feel like that happened with metalcore and like the hardcore scene where like all the kids who were there for the breakdowns and all the fun stuff you know when that got taken out they were all like all right well at this point i like like bands like knock loose anyway so yeah they're not going to go to see those other bands and then all the other bands that like them for their catchy parts they're not really like there was like a playfulness about, you know, metalcore at, a while ago that they kind of I felt like kind of lost it and then that's when the popularity declined. Interesting. And, and then that's when emo rap like came through like a mm. wrecking ball honestly and a lot of kids who otherwise would have been into scene bands were getting into emo rappers because people like Little Peep and like, you know, Juice World and uh, you know, X and like all these artists basically played like a rock star role and a rapper role. It's like hard to compete with that, you know? It's hard, yeah. They and, fucking killed it. And then like the, the age of social media, you know, it's, I'm sure you know this from running a band account, is it's like running a company, you know, when yeah. people connect more usually to people's like personal uh, Instagrams or like their yeah. social media sites where when you run mm -hmm. a band one, it's like you ought to be creative to keep people interested in it. Totally. When people just end up following the singer anyways. You yeah, know? yeah. So totally. it's like just like these artists just had like all kinds of advantages on their side, I felt like. You know, yeah. that was kind of one of the things that I found different. But I always loved how much like metal was an influence on like those kids and like alternative music was an influence on them. Yeah. Because to me it was it was like, oh, great. Like hip hop is getting more alternative. That's like that's amazing to me. I'm sign me up for that, you know, like. I would all genres get more alternative. Like I love, yeah, like, great. <laughs> like alternative R and B. You know, like it's amazing and all that sort of stuff. Anything. Yeah, you. I mean, you're a very rare, rare person. Like you're actually not only are you a fan of music, but you're actually in this. You're not. You're not on the sidelines. You're actually in the world of hip hop, uh, rock and metal. So you have a very unique perspective, and you're also uh, very good at analyzing so I'm, I'm really curious about about your your thoughts on this 
Where do you see metal going? You know, I was thinking about this last night because I figured we'd talk about this. Uh, yeah. So I see a couple things that I think are indicators for like, I think the industrial thing is probably gonna keep like coming up more and more, like what Code Orange is doing and their stuff, because I think the 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 hybrid of how people make music now with like computers and stuff being so accessible, everyone can learn to engineer yeah. to some degree with mm-hmm. like three days and YouTube and TikTok. You know, you can <laughs> you can at least learn to like record yourself, and yeah. uh, that's different than. Then, like, when you guys were coming up, how you, like, would jam songs out, you know? That's yeah. not really how I feel like most bands write anymore. I feel like most bands write on the computer because you leave the session with a demo, you know, that you can listen back to and stuff versus, like, when you jam it, it's a little harder to have, like, a perspective, you know, on, like, what's it actually going to sound like, you know, versus now. So I can see music the hybrid of like the real band thing versus like the electronic thing has just been going more and more in that direction and when i say electronic i don't just mean like you know like house music and stuff like that i mean like just sense atmosphere like it seems like at one point that was like a little frowned upon or something yeah but i feel like the the weight of it or just how popular it was has outweighed like the criticism of it where every band now has texture and like strings and stuff like that you know and some sort of so I think that's probably going to go more and more. Where the, I mean, the trap metal thing is, is huge right now. I think it's going to keep going more in like a metal direction too. They're going to see interesting hybrids of mm-hmm. like full band parts, like breakdowns and stuff like that with oh, like trap beats and stuff, different kinds of production type stuff, you know, thrown in. Probably I think a lot of Slipknot's early influences has been rearing its head a lot again, you know. Um, yeah. When when metalcore is gonna step away from the Lincoln Park mixed with Meshuggah thing, I'm not sure yet. You know, <laughs> not all the way sure. Someone said it finally. <laughs> Someone fucking said it. Thank you. Well, it's just I I mean I love that stuff too because it's like it's, it's such a great same I like do. with like you know architects and stuff like that. Yeah. I feel like I feel like architects. Uh, they're definitely the best at it. I think. Yeah, I think I think they're uh, shout out to they have them. the best. They're awesome. They have like the best. Uh, the best riffs in that like department, you know, and Mm -hmm. Sam's just the best at like the pitch scream thing in like my opinion and stuff. Yeah. So, but it seems like as of right now, it's basically whatever bring me the horizon and architects does like the people just kind of like copy it, just kind of follow it in some, Mm -hmm. which I guess I think it's always been that way. Maybe I just notice it a little more now. Um, But yeah, that's, I kind of think you're just going to see more like crazy hybrids of metal and other genres like pop hyper pop is a big thing that right now we're um yeah i think you're just gonna see metal popping up in all sorts of like crazy places where you normally wouldn't see it and i think that's probably just the future of music in general is like just genre collabs like that it's hard to foresee because some kid in their bedroom is like perfecting it right now wow you know it seems like that's because now everyone can find out about anything, you know, like with Spotify and stuff. It's not like, yeah, you know, where you have to go to a record store and stumble on albums and stuff anymore. Kids, yeah. kids nowadays are into everything, like all kinds of different music. So I think you'll, mm-hmm. when they create music, it's probably going to reflect that more. Yeah, you'll probably go back to to what it was. Like people may be creating metal, but taking all forms of artists, all kinds of artists, and putting them into yeah, you know. I think so. I think that we're going to see all sorts of interesting, like, like wow, didn't think I'd hear this metal version of this kind of music, you know? But yeah. um, metal is really adaptable, you know? I think that's one of the things that people yeah. who are more on the elitist side of things and who have a very narrow view of what metal can and can't be and stuff, I think mm-hmm. they're just wrong in in totally. this case. It's extremely adaptable music that you can put in all sorts of different genres Um, like effortlessly like there's no reason why you can't you know like the influence is really easy to apply in other places you know so Mm -hmm. I don't see why it's probably going to spread a lot I think we're going to see a lot of crazy yeah genre hybrids of not just metal but like just all sorts of music that's exciting yeah totally it's a lot of people paint doom and gloom pictures about like music today and old man screaming out of cloud you know (laughs) kind of thing but 
I don't know. I disagree. I think music's great now. That's awesome. Remember uh, back back in the day, I would uh, describe pseudo songs to people. And I'm like, oh, I mean, I want to combine like, you know, skinless and corn. They're like, that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard. And now everyone does it. Yeah, that's with, like. Without, without like a blink of an eye. That's like a know. safe. I, to, I feel like that's like a, not a crazy. Like the fact that people thought that was a crazy idea at one point is kind of funny now. You know? Yeah, I know. It's so strange. It made so much sense. Corn groove was like some blast beats and then some some hardcore breakdowns influenced by like Throwdown and mm-hmm. stuff like that. Like seems so stupid. People were like, dude, that's that's never going to work. And, Wrong. And now that's like that's been the standard for yeah, the past two decades. I, I feel like I feel like there was like a period where everyone was just wanting the metal like that metal purist kind of audience just really wanted breakdowns to go away, and there's just yeah. way too cool to ever go anywhere. Like I know, and they just never got to really. It's kind of funny too because. Uh, the best, the be- the most, I feel like the most common thread with all metal, at least the most popular stuff, is that it's a combo of metal and hardcore. Like, yeah. that is a, a thread you can follow through every, like, other than, like, power metal and some, like, European forms of, like, subgenre metal. Like, it's, yeah. it's in everything. So yep. the fact that some people have, like, weird thing about, you know, that combo is just funny. You it's know? funny. Where it's like... It's so it's such a small like wall division wall between metal and hardcore where it's like it's the same thing. It is the same thing, huh? It's, it's just per, it's, pretty much. It's they're like slight cultural differences, but mm-hmm. musically, as especially if we're if you play a riff, you play a corn riff. It's at today's age, you would depending on what the drums and what the singer does, it could be a hardcore song just as easy. Or if you play like a five finger death punch riff, that could easily be a hardcore riff. You know, it just wow. It's really the drums and the vocals that kind of like is the difference. I feel like between, but the best bands like yeah. what Metallica, Slayer, Slipknot, like you got like y'all, like everyone. It's it, there's a combo of the two. Yeah. So it's, I don't think it. At one point, it was a little crazy to be into like both, but yeah. now I feel like it's just so common that it's like interwebbed. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's so common now, and I, I know you probably heard the same thing that I've always hear, like all oh, like the, like the guitar is dying, uh, is is the guitar dead? Like what? Like like what do you think about that, dude? Uh, the, so wrong. I literally make a living off of this not being true because. Sick. So a lot of how I collaborate with other producers who work with artists who I normally can't get to is. So guitar in like hip hop and pop music and stuff, yeah, for the, probably like 2008 to 14, very synth heavy, not much guitar going on in pop music, for sure. But then when like the emo rap thing came around, that changed. Like guitar music is everywhere. Like it's all over the radio. Like the huh. and it's alternative guitar riffs too. It's not like just it's stuff super influenced by like, you know, Nirvana, like a lot of, if you listen to Post Malone songs, like it's clear where his influence from, even like super hood stuff, like, you know, like rappers like, uh, Shoreline Mafia or even like Roddy Rich, like there's, it's guitar based stuff, you know, and it's usually like riffs that you might hear in like the intro of like some emo song or something like that. It's super similar. It's just the drums and the, uh, bass and stuff is different. So a lot of what we'll do is like I'll make a bunch of riffs, basically songs without uh, drums on them. And because a lot of hip hop producers and like pop producers and stuff, their strength will be drums. You know, like, yeah, that genre is dictate drums dictate that genre, drum and bass, the drum and bass, which is why it's so adaptable is because no matter what sort of melody you put over that drum groove, like from whatever genre, acoustic guitar, flute, like whatever, it's still falls into that genre you know like Mm -hmm. so adding alternative guitars is the main um like backdrop of like modern pop music basically mixed with beats that's dominating music so you can make a live the biggest uh, the best example i can think of is this dude omar fetty who plays he's a guitar player he plays on most of mgk's album play the new like Kid Leroy, Justin Bieber song. He's like an alternative kid who's who's a ripping guitar player, 
He's one of the biggest producers in the world, and he's like 21, and he's a guitar wow. player. That's what he does. He plays guitar on a lot of these records. Whoa. So that shows you how not dead guitar is. Like A lot of us will make a bunch of songs without drums, send them to producers. A lot of them are guitar-based, you know, and that's what... Uh, you know, is like dominating popular music. So it's super wow. not true. If now is like the best time to be a guitar player, I feel like in a long time, because really, yeah, because if you're good, if if you're good enough to like make, it's the bar is not super high in that world of like you know technicality or whatever. Say like maybe it is in like death metal or something like that. Yeah. Even though like when you get into the pop world, you'll meet the best musicians you've ever met in your life who play circles around. Just yeah. about anybody, like, mm -hmm. you know, because those dudes are just, like, top tier, especially the dudes who play in, like, big pop stars bands and stuff like that. Yeah. Craziest musicians. But if you listen to a lot of the stuff, like, you hear on the radio, you got to just be good enough to do some minor chords, a little arpeggiating and stuff like that. And yeah. that's, you can have songs good enough. You're good enough. You know, that was, that was one thing, too, I felt that was really important for me younger, which kind of stuck with me is that, why I got so into punk first was because I had just started playing guitar and I was like, oh, part of the thing with this is you can be a beginner and still start a band yeah. and still create music. Like there's no, there's no bar on how good you have to be to create music. You can create music at any stage of, you know, even if you can only play one note on piano, like you can turn that into a song somehow. Uh, That's what's up. Yeah. So I felt like uh, with guitar playing, you know, if you just say you want to work with, said artists and the only way you're good at guitar you can record yourself the best way to do that is to find out who produces for them like and reach out you know and like see if you can send them guitar ideas you know without any drums or like anything like that just if you can write some like a song structure and send them that and have them collab you know and then maybe you know if it the, all the pieces align you'll get a placement with said artist or you'll get a placement somewhere like you maybe not who you're expecting but you just got to kind of go with the wind with this kind of stuff you know where throw your riffs out there and you know even like if you have to record yourself playing riffs and stuff just so you have content on the internet so people can see that you can do it you know yeah but yeah if you're especially if you're like a good metal guitar player or something like that dude like just <laughs> write some like you know, turn your distortion off a little bit and like some clean lead thing you do could be like a pop, could be a pop melody for a beat or something. Wow. Just got to think of music a little less like black and white and like, you know, the tones of something is what makes a genre. The style of beats is what makes a genre and stuff. But there's a lot of similarities. Like I, that's what I found with doing multiple genres is music has so much in common more than it doesn't have in common. Yeah. You can take a drum groove from anywhere. You can take a riff idea from anywhere. And it just depends on like what you play it on and, you know, what the mm -hmm. backdrop is, is what makes it. Wow. At least that's what I think. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe. But I think that's that's worked for me, at least, is to try and like relate everything to what I'm like, what I'm used to. Yeah. I think that's a very healthy uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, it's awesome. Yeah. I've, I've you know, some people... And it obviously varies, you know. If I was some bands and stuff like that, I wouldn't recommend, like, you know, going too far out into the weeds and stuff like that. Like, yeah. a band, you know, like what Slayer did or, like, Hatebreed or Cannibal Corpse, like, those kind of bands that, like, dominate a sound. Yeah. And they are, like, that's they're super good at that. If what you're making, like, that's contrast to that or, like, you're taking it in different directions isn't coming out as good as mm -hmm. that, maybe it is better to... You know, like keep hammering what you're good at and taking little steps like out to like test the waters, you know? Yeah. But that's a different, you know, that's a different thing than being a producer. You can throw your riffs a million different, a million different ways, you know, and when you're like a, a producer, I guess, or like you make music to give to other people, you yeah. know, versus for like, say, your own project or like your own band or whatever. Totally. It's, yeah. You ever worked on a song and then you gave it that like you didn't weren't so stoked on and you gave it to like another uh, ties in what you were saying earlier. They were you gave it to another artist and they loved it and then they turn it into like a yeah totally a fuck oh that's like a big song now. Oh man, what man? Honestly, one thing too that I, I've learned is that when it comes to not overproducing, has been a real like 
thing I've been like trying to get better at like for years, you know, because coming from metal, yeah. it's very dense music to where, you know, my taste had just got like drawn into like lots of textures and layers and stuff like that, which can be cool. But sometimes you have to like strip stuff back. And like if something's kind of boring sounding to you, I've found that that's good, like a place to stop because then it leaves room for the vocalist to, you know, have a bigger picture of like imagination or whatever, what they can do vocally. Yeah. And if you have to do more production, sometimes you can do it after the fact. But there's been tons of songs where I'm like, yeah, this beat's okay. And then when they do the song to it, I'm like, great. I'm so glad I didn't add that like extra lead or I didn't add that like extra layer that would have distracted from wow. whatever dude's mo vocal melody ended up becoming because... I, you know, was like, oh, this is kind of boring. I'm going to, like, jazz it up a little bit or, like, whatever. You know, sometimes sometimes less is more, and it's – some. I feel like it's easier to make complex arrangement stuff. Like It is. Linear – you know what I mean? Like, writing, yeah. like, linear songs where you're just like, we'll go from this riff, then we'll just go to this – because then you just throw shit at the wall versus totally. when you have to, like, have just a couple ideas, but the ideas have to be strong enough to keep someone's attention, the Absolutely. whole idea. Absolutely. The hardest, dude. It's it's way, it's way a different ball game, you know? It is. Yeah, coming up with, like, the simple stuff is is the hardest. Mm -hmm. I remember, remember when I was here and you guys wrote the riff uh, for Fuck Everything when oh, we, yeah. were doing the, we were doing guitar lessons? Yeah. It was so that. funny. I remember that. That just, yeah, because okay, that was a good example of where that riff was just, like, it was just like one or no it was the yolo rip that thing yeah i remember when you guys came up with that i was i was you're, here you were there yeah i was yeah. here and wow. i remember being like mark being like, oh that's super simple it was like super simple but super sick and you were like yeah let's say and then that ended up being that, that crazy yeah those are the hardest those simple riffs are the hardest to come up with they are that's why it's a lot fucked. of fucked so you know, I'm sure you hear this all. I've heard this all the time, but where people are like, "Oh, pop music's so easy to make," you know, like it's the hardest to make. It's no, it's not easy to make. Yeah, the like coming up, yeah, with a simple idea that's good enough to last a whole song is not easy. That's why a lot of and that's the most effective thing because even in metal, that's the most popular songs too. You know, yeah. it's song that you get that one. That one riff that's just worth listening to for three minutes, you know, it's hard to beat. <laughs> yeah, hard to beat that. It's hard to beat that, man. <laughs> We're like tired, especially even like the new metal era. Like what, like, you know, maybe like a couple riffs per song. You know, usually. Yeah, and that's, that's it. I think that's kind of my favorite thing is with songs is where it's, it's a couple ideas in metal stuff. I love a good breakdown. I love the deviation into like making something. Like splintering it, even if you have a soft song, you know, if you add like just a crushing breakdown somewhere in there, it's usually that's a fire like uh, method, yeah. you know. Um, but yeah, I've, I've, it's all just dynamics, you know. I think there's another good thing that you I like heard from you guys was talking about how to like build a song up and peak it and then bring it back down to build it back up again, you yeah. know. Yeah. I think we talked a bit about that before, a few times where. Uh, yeah, that was super influential to me too. Like, was wow, because before you know, sometimes in your head you're just like, oh, I just want to be up here the whole time. But then when everything's heavy, nothing's heavy. Totally. It's like totally. It's like dynamics that make something heavy. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Maybe like there's various forms of aggression, but you know, I found like, like I would say like Bludgeon to Death is one of the heaviest breakdowns of all time. Like in my opinion. Wow. One of you know it, it, it's definitely up there in top five at least like, <laughs> sick but it's simple it's, it's so simple yeah but it's just like letting that like let chord breathe. just resonate yeah. out especially dun, too when you guys do a lot yeah dun, 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 dun. it's perfect you know it's like it's, yeah that sort of thing is perfect but uh yeah i, I found I, I one thing i'm curious about is okay so i was me and my me and zach my friend zach were talking about this um about some of the differences between metal and hardcore. And I'm wondering where like suicide silence is like men mentality is on this, where a lot of times, you know, with, with hardcore bands that lean more in that direction, uh, like we were talking about this with knock loose, like knock loose music essentially is like kind of the perfect mosh music yeah. Where with hardcore, you know, you con you consciously write parts for, to be danced to a specific way, like two steps, side to sides, 
breakdowns, yeah. circle pits, you know, like yeah. stomps, like all, all the sort of things you can do uh, musically and like drum wise specifically to create different movement in the pit. Yeah. Uh, hardcore is very like conscious of that, but metal is more like on the side of just push mosh, circle pit, not really the se- like specific dancing, you know? Yeah. In the same way. Um, would you guys ever write like parts with the pit in mind? Like when you wrote like say the bludgeon to death breakdown where you guys kind of like people are going to like kill each other to this oh, part, yeah. you know? To- totally. And that, and that that ties into what we're talking about with uh, dynamics mm-hmm. is uh, people, uh, which you probably hear about a lot, like people listen to metal and like don't hear like the dynamics, but there is dynamics there. Like if you're mm-hmm. doing like, let's say a bludgeon, like you're doing like, like, like a thrash, but SS was very like conscious of this. Mm-hmm. We're going to fucking thrash, but we're going to thrash better. Mm-hmm. Than, than the metal bands do it. Yep. And so it seems like extreme, then we're gonna blast mm-hmm. crazier than like the techno bands, and then out of nowhere, we're gonna do this fucking done. Yeah. Done. Dun, so you build tension dun. with the, the tension, fast parts. You, you build a tension, and then it's like a circle pit going, it's tension and tension out of fucking nowhere. You're yep. gonna fucking slam. Yeah. Harder than a hardcore band would. Yeah, exactly. So you have these two like, Mm-hmm. You know, opposing like dynamics. You have to thrash harder than the thrashers, yep. and you slam harder than 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 the hardcore bands. Yep. And you just give people something fucking totally. I thin. feel like that's one thing that like is one of the the shining tropes that uh, of deathcore is like, you know, like legacy or the scene or whatever is just pushing breakdowns to like the most cool. Yeah. Probably, I would argue it's like. To me, that's what's heavy when I think of like someone's like describe something heavy. It's like, yeah, it bludgeoned to death would be an example of something like this is heavy, like, yeah, where it's just letting those low frequencies like just kind of like take it. That was one of the reasons I got drawn into producing hip hop was because 808s reminded me of breakdowns. Like, I just write yeah. 808s like I yeah, write breakdowns. Yeah. It's yeah. the exact same mentality, it's just like wow, awesome. different sounds, you know, but it's the same patterns, same. Like, that's exactly how I think about it was because I know how to write breakdowns. I was able to take that, like, ideology of writing because breakdowns are a skill. Like, people will will try and hate it. Like, everyone, breakdowns are easy. To get the breakdown right to where you know know when you do it because you look out and people, it's just everywhere, you know? Like, (laughs) it's just just going on. And there's also a key factor is... uh, uh, you can't fake it, no. like, uh, which which is hard to do now. On uh, weirdly enough, back then, bludgeon and death seems like we're trying to be heavy, but this this is the key factor no one talks about. We weren't trying. I wasn't trying to be heavy. I wasn't trying to be the heaviest band in the world. It's like this is this is what is inside mm-hmm. my body, and you fucking screaming out, and yeah. it, it just comes out that way. Like yo, I want to go boom. Boom, but, yeah, but, totally. it, but it comes from like your heart. Yeah, and then when you put it out there, and then the way it. Oh, it's pure caveman. Yeah, it's oh, uh, you said the keywords. Caveman is primal. You bring out that yeah. primal thing at the fullest capacity. Yep. People can't. People start dancing. Yeah, exactly. It's just like it's like a run, like a run, a run, a run mm-hmm. fire. You know, it's just it's, it's the same thing. It's I think it's just rhythmic, rhythm. I think like the rhythmic unity of like breakdowns and just like the 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 mentality of at least breakdowns. How we are talking about breakdowns and like the metal yeah. way. Yeah. Uh, is just as heavy as it gets you know yeah. in my opinion like <laughs> yeah it's just yeah the low t- it doesn't have to be low tune you know it's like uh, winds of plague's first few albums are in standard e and yeah it's so all heavy. Tr- it's all trickery it's all like chord yeah. trickery you know but uh just something about that like the drums and the kick playing the same thing as the guitar and the bass god There's some atmosphere behind it or something like that you know so sick it's just that's it's just as good as it gets for music in my opinion <laughs> dude it's cool how you took like because you're like a scene kid at heart you know it's cool how you took all the it's also what is so crucial what you did is you didn't which a lot of bands fail at you didn't take the sound from bands but you took you took the mentality like you took the spirit of, of all, all these genres and and then you put it into what you do. Yeah, you know? I just kind of like run by the fact that like I just want to make music that uh, I would want to listen to, you know, like Huge. or I try and think like what is what is what do I wish was happening that's not happening that I can try and make happen the best I can, you know? Yeah. To where it's like, like I wish some band, I wish there was this band went more in this direction, you know, or totally. like what would that sound like? So yeah, maybe I should try and like you know 
fuck with it and see if I can come up with something. A lot of times yeah. I just fall ass backwards into shit. Like I don't, I'm not really like sitting there like contemplating like in my head. Like I feel like um, this is where a lot of band like tension, a lot of like fighting I've noticed from bands is when you get too caught up in the th- talking about the theory of what you think your band should sound like or say your album should sound like while you're working on it and not enough focused on what's actually coming out of the music, hmm. you know, where you'll be like, I think we need to go more in this direction and mix this with that, you know, versus, you know, where you're getting an art d- disagreement about essentially the idea of what a direction should like you should go in. But uh, maybe that idea when someone says it to you sounds totally different in your head than it sounds to like in their head. Yeah. And you get in disagreements about it versus like... Yeah. Where you're just like, let me just write the song out and like show you what I'm thinking, and then you yeah. know we can have a discussion about uh, what it sounds like. Yeah. When uh, you know sometimes you'll you'll do that, or I've done that with tons of bands where they'll be like, oh, like yeah, this is fire, like this. I, where it's like, even if you're like, I told you, in their head it sounded different, you know. Totally. So if you get too caught up with talking about the theory of what you think your band should sound like, and almost like, yeah. oh, I gotta mix all this stuff. To, Try not to get lost in the weeds with that. You know, I just kind of like let, totally. like, this idea is cool. This idea is cool. Just ask backwards. Idea, cool idea after cool idea and just run with whatever yeah. direction my taste goes in, you know? Yeah. Yeah, you're right. It's really hard to, ex- yeah, it's pretty much, it's actually impossible to explain ideas correctly. Like, you gotta just, like, kind of show them. Mm-hmm. Like, you kind of like, oh, this is the way it is. And I'll show them, like, show them, like, like a beat or something. Yeah, yeah, totally. Know? Where, uh, yeah, if you get too caught up in the weeds of talking about the theory of it, I think that's when. That's kind of where I, I I try not to to do that too much. Even though it's that's fun, it's fun to do that because you can. That's where you come up with weird ideas and stuff like that. But yeah. uh, I've seen it go. I've just seen when members are just totally different pages, like creatively yeah. and stuff. You know, sometimes yeah. that makes the best music because that's that's how I feel like good combos get made is when you have the right people working from different perspectives yeah. musically, but it coming together. No one's really satisfied at the end, but because everyone yeah. had to compromise something, you come up with something a little more original, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's really hard to get on, like, the same page. Who, who's who been, who's more, like, laid back? Is it, like, is it, like, the bands or is it, like, the hip-hop artists? Oh, it's the, uh, it's the hip-hop artists. Really? Just laid back? Just, like, they're gonna record a shitload of music, so they're just kind of, like... Just waiting to fall into one, you know. They're just kind of waiting for the, to land on the right song. So, huh? I found that, yeah. Just overall, like the sessions are usually more f- like lighthearted, just because the work is a little less technical. Because you're not, you're not a. Uh, a lot of times you've already made the beat, so you've already made the instrumental mix. So it's just them writing vocals and coming up with ideas. So it's just kind of that, like that a lot. You get that a lot, you know. Where wow. or if you make the beat in front of the artist too, that's fun because then they get to have a little bit of a say in what you do. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've just found, too, like, because it's just the difference of what we were talking about, recording an album, excuse me, recording an album, like, in a two-week time period, and that's the album. You got two weeks to make it. Yeah. Versus just, like, going out there, making a bunch of music, and then putting it together later, you know, and deciding what's the best song you have, like, after Whoa. you've kind of, like gotten your it's how that's how like pop is written you know that's how a lot of also that's how a lot of metalcore is written i don't mean to blow the cap off but like so many bands like it's funny that people get like really stuck up about stuff like real drums or like was these with these guitars mic'd or are these vocals tuned blah blah like everything even like the bands that people like worship and stuff like that if they knew like how programmed and how like edited everything is and how a lot of times bands write with a lot of different songwriters and stuff. It's not just the people in the bands making music yeah. all the time. That's not that's actually more rare than it is common. And when you find when I remember when I found that out about like metal and the rock world, I was like, wow. But like that's that's crazy. You almost feel like it's uh some of like the more purists will be like, that's um have like a little bit of like a snot like snotty opinion about it, you know? Yeah. Because but all that matters is the songs come out the best way they can, you know, like that you make the best product of music and collaboration is just like a beautiful thing where yeah, I love collaborating like because a lot you'll think of stuff I won't think of, you know, and yeah, 
you'll make the most wide range of music by working with multiple people, you know, and you'll find what works, what doesn't work a little more. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I think that, like, the collaborative spirit of, like, like working with hip hop and stuff like that really, like, I try to, like, bring that more into my rock stuff I, and metal stuff I work on, too, because I've just found, like, like, I have friends, you know, who are, like, they're, that dude's a better guitar player than me, to be honest. So, I, like, let's let him come write riffs with us, you know, because yeah. his riffs are sick. So it's just about coming up with the best, you know, the best music. And at the end of the day, I feel like that's kind of like my yeah. producer hat, you know, is just mm. however it gets written, it doesn't matter. Like the process of it doesn't matter. It's the outcome that matters. Whether yeah. you did it all analog or whether you did it digital, like no one, no one gives a shit. Like, you True. know, You're right. unless, you know, unless it's a special case, like with the cleansing, like that's an example where I'd be like, right band, right sound, right producer, the rawness and like the live aspect is part of why it's so dope. Yeah. But other bands have tried the same thing and had much less results, you know, because they, they weren't making the right creative decisions. Like you guys did, you know, you knew you had yeah. that shit down. So yeah, it came out the perfect way it should, you know, yeah. you ever um, wrote like a song or a beat or both. And then a hip hop artist kind of comes in and then it didn't sound like, like like a single, but once they started singing over it, it it, it, it became a single. Hundred percent, yeah. Like, I don't even think of anything as a single until there's vocals on it and the song idea is done, wow. like, or at least the song idea is going, because that's fifty uh, percent of it. You know, it's You're that's right. how music is. That's how you get paid. Is that's how music is broken up: half vocal, half instrumental. Like. You know, whoever writes the vocal gets one half, whoever gets, depending on, you know, whatever, but yeah. just that's how music is split up. So to me, yeah, it's like, I've had tons of instrumentals that I love and then vocals get on it and I just can't seem to get a vocal that fits right. And to me, it's just like, oh, well, like this instrumental, maybe it sounds great on its own, but maybe that's why it's hard to get vocals on it, you know, or like uh. sometimes it's the opposite. I'll be like, this is super bare bones, like, or even if I'm just like, yeah, it's, it's cool. And then someone will do vocals on it. And I'm like, this is why I, I don't make my mind up until I hear vocals because now I love it, you know? Damn. That's so, right. Yeah, I totally, it's, yeah, that's the, I mean, that's the reality. Just that's what a lot of kids just mainly care about is that that vocal just has to be right, you know? But uh, I feel like now a lot of times too, we live in the age where, uh, if the beats, if the beats hard, like producers, producers are killing it because beats are just so hard now, you know, like that they are a lot of the song where people mm -hmm. fuck. You'd rather listen to a beat by itself than just a vocalist singing, you know, nine yeah. times out of 10. Yeah, true. So, yeah, I, I don't know. It's just, yeah, I kind of just got into it because in skate videos and stuff when I was a kid, you know, there'd be instrumental hip hop tracks playing. I never really listened to like rap without the 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 vocals so kind of triggered my ear for it now when i get older i'm like i hear a beat you know and i can i try and imagine myself like you know i'll write i'll write vocals over it like i'll come up with ideas and stuff like that just so mm -hmm. i can like think like a singer to at least have a grasp on whether you know uh this is easy to sing on or not yeah because that's important you know say like you write a riff or something like that and you like trying to picture vocals but you know it, you're having a hard time doing it maybe it, Maybe, you know, you should alter the riff a little to make it easier to make vocals. I don't know. Like, it's... Oh. I try and think of... I keep the vocals in mind when I make music. It's just... Yeah, you have to, huh? Yeah. I that's, feel... That's true. Yeah, definitely. No matter what the genre is. Like... Yeah. The biggest metal stuff is the catchiest. There's, there's a reason for that. And writing the catchy stuff is also on that list of hardest to do. Yeah, exactly. You just... I don't know, man. I could, like I could fucking sit all day and just do this. Yeah, lightning. so easy. But to write that fucking simple, mm -hmm. catchy, the one that's catching and stays, stays stays in your head. Lightning in a bottle. Yeah, you're right. But you're right, uh, it's a numbers game too. The more you write, you're gonna stumble on something. You're riffing all the time. You're writing all the time. You know, like yeah. I mean, I it's different for different people. I get some people. You know, they write an album. Like they kind of save up all their creative energy for that time period. And they just kind of like gush it out. Yeah. Some people write all the time, you know, just whatever works best for you. You know, you have to, it's no, there's no 
right way to do it or wrong way to do it. It's just whatever. True. However you make the best music you can make, that's what you should do. You uh, know? That's, so whatever works for the person, right? Yeah, and I know that's like one of those things where it's like easier said than done because sure. finding out what works for you is not like a universal thing. Like I can tell yeah. you what worked for me, but that doesn't mean it's going to work for you. Or yeah. like, you know, you can tell me what worked for you, but that doesn't mean it's going to work for me. You know, like your path is different than my path. Like, yeah. you know, everyone's path is like different. So especially in music, you know, some bands, um, you know, some bands uh, get – blow up right away like soon as they come out with music or before they even come out with music you know you'll have a career like already started some bands you got to really work for that shit like really hard but yeah. uh you know it's not a universal thing it's not huh nah if it, it it'd be nice if it was if there was like a playbook but you know you have to it's just all about analyzing like your situations you know like that you're in like playing your cards right totally Speaking of playing cards, but how how are you on time? I have like one or two two more questions. Oh, I'm I'm good. I'm, good? I'm here. Okay, I'm here cool. as long as as long as you want me. Speaking of speaking of playing your cards right, um, you're very, you know, you look like a maniac, but you're a very <laughs> humble guy, and you're very a very sweet guy, and you're very you're very good at connecting with with people and relating with people, more so with artists. Mm -hmm. You know how did it, um, and you were grinding for so long and then how did the opportunity arise with bones? I, I mean, you met oh, him at yeah. a mall, right? Just a, yeah. randomly. Yeah, I did. Yeah. I was at red. It's not there anymore, but red zone in Burbank, you know, it's like this metal hardcore t-shirt, like accessory place. And oh, uh, shit. I just saw him like walk. He just walked by. I was a big fan of his. He's honestly probably like one of my favorite rappers, like of all time. Yeah, his very one of those one of the dudes who like he's huge. He has a huge underground fan base. He's still like a huge artist. Yeah, but he's even like underappreciated. Like to, you know, he he still plays in front of thousands of people every night. But yeah, he really did like create modern like hip hop as we know it in a lot of ways. Like in terms, at least on the like probably the the first dude I heard seeing like emo melodies over like trap beats and stuff like that. At least you know, or at least the first dude who really like took that and kind of went with it that he what he did like little peep and like people like that ended up like kind of because bones did a lot of stuff yeah so uh that was just like an element of his sound not his whole entire sound you know so other people took elements of kind of what he was doing and stuff and like mm -hmm. ran with it you know and like yeah. made it their thing so yeah. yeah i met him at the mall and um i had told him you know i'd produce for omen who he knew about omen yeah and you know, he was, like, a, into metalcore and stuff like that, too. So, like, I just, like, talked to him about music I knew we liked together. Like, I just related to the dude's music. So I knew that, like, when I met him, you know, we'd get along. So, and I was making beats very much, like, with the same vibe. You know, I was, like, we were, like, kind of on the same page, like, creatively in that yeah. way. So, yeah, it just goes, don't be afraid to talk to people, you know? Like, that's really what it was. It was just I wasn't afraid to go, hey, what's up, bro? Like, you don't you don't have to obviously be a punisher you know like don't yeah. be ridiculous about it but <laughs> but you know if you if if you want to work with an artist you like or something like that and you're in a casual situation and you get to meet them yeah. you know like just like talk to them like you would your friends or whatever you know and just be like oh hey i make music you know if you'll be surprised some people some stuff some nothing might happen but sometimes something does happen you know like you just can't be afraid to put yourself out there Totally. Because of the fear of rejection, you know? Yeah. It's better to be rejected than to uh, wonder, like, oh, man, I messed up. And like, 100%. I'd rather be rejected than regret, you know? Yeah. And you seem to really... Because uh, a lot of people struggle with that. Also, they struggle with uh, being caught up in the moment and they get to, like, oh, this is, like, my one shot. And they're, they're overly mm -hmm. aggressive, mm -hmm. you know? I, I mean, have you learned, like, okay, this is how... You're supposed to talk to, to talk to them like like people not be so aggressive and like desperate. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Yeah, people really struggle with that. Yeah, definitely. People de people definitely feel like oh, this is my one shot. I got to take it, and that means going as hard as I can. Yeah, that's that's like the kind of working harder, not smarter mentality. You know, yeah. where it's it's not necessary. It's better to relate with someone like personally, you know, than it is to like obviously like I'm a huge fan of your like we're I'm a huge fan of yours. Like we're friends and everything, yeah. and you know it's been it's great. And, but like, 
you were someone I looked up to before I knew you, you know, as was what I mean, like in mm -hmm. terms of. So when I got to meet you guys, though, it was one of those things where I was like, oh, cool. Like we like a lot of the same stuff. So I felt like we could relate as friends, you know, You're right. more than I did. Like, oh, I'm just meeting like my like idols or like a band I love, you know, type of thing. Yeah. Where um, some people you're better off doing that, you know, like say I knew you like like corn, you know, so I was like, oh, dude, like I like corn too, blah, blah, blah. talk yeah. about corn or I yeah. play guitar, you play guitar, like whatever you have in common, you know, like just talk about that because people, someone comes up to me and starts talking about stuff I'm into, like, yeah, Start, I'm, yeah. I'm happy to talk about that stuff, you know? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I've just found, you know, a nice middle ground. I don't know, it's, it's, it's one of those things you got to have somewhat of a, like, a sixth sense for or just like it's like learn knowledge kind of where i've i've found uh when to like seize an opportunity and when it's safer just to like you know step back and not overplay my card you know i've met tons of people where uh it just didn't feel right to like you know try and be aggressive about working with the person because they're like yeah. having fun with their friends or something like that and they're those moments happen too yeah it, 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 do, do you get that i had had this feeling uh, last month with someone, I was like, oh, I, I want to ask him something. But you get like this gut feeling like this is not the right moment. Don't do it. Did you, yeah. did you, I, 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 do you get that? Yes. Yeah. So I'll get that. And when I get that, I'll just kind of like, like be like, okay, like I'm going to, I'm going to keep an eye out, you know, and just see if like a moment presents itself. Yeah. And if the moment presents itself, then, you know, I'll, I'll approach with, uh, you know, trying to like relate more to the person or whatever. But, okay. um, if I don't feel the moment happens, then I'm not gonna do it. Like, yeah. But uh, a lot of times you'll you'll find like a, a moment that works. You know, sometimes it just depends on what it is exactly. True. So if it's just like just wanting to know something about someone, you know, the, most people are happy to talk about themselves. So yeah. <laughs> you know, you're pretty safe. But yeah, totally. I've definitely yeah many times just been like. It's not the right time. Like, if the right time presents itself, great. But yeah. right now, it's, it's, you know, I would rather... You can only make your first impression once, too, you know? It's true. So if you want to work with someone, sometimes it's better to, like, yeah, wait the moment out and then, like, have a better first impression the second time if it's going to happen, you know? You're playing, di right. you're playing with the dice, but... Yeah, you're right. It's true. You know, social social smarts is like a... A whole other world in itself you know it that's is, hard to get it's it's a big it took me years to figure that whole scene out you know? yeah just networking mm -hmm. yeah networking is is a whole art form it is and <laughs> yeah and, and then working was something i didn't expect like it's just i think there's like a a negative thing to it but networking i figure out like it's it's just doing what doing what you do is hard mm -hmm. you know so you want to you want to be around other people that are doing it and that kind of keeps you absolutely some consciously motivated and driven so when yep. you're out, so when you're out there in public you're meeting similar people it's like oh yeah I'm like, oh, oh this is this is what people talk about this is networking but like you're it just helps you in like a weird way yeah totally like man being i can't even talk like mention how much like or i can't even like fathom how much just being around other creatives, you know, like on the same page as me and that being like my friends. And when me and my friends hang out, we make music. Like that's what I do for fun on top of a job. Like it's, I'm just always doing it with my friends and yeah, that's what makes it fun, you know, is like just hanging out is making music. Like that's, yeah, it's great. So uh, for me, you know, it's one of those things where that's, in, that's an, I'm definitely not only friends with people who make music, you know, that's like, I wouldn't recommend that either. Just being friends with people just because of what they do. Yeah. But, um, I do have a lot of friends who, you know, like that's a making music with someone is a definitely a super intimate thing, you know, like mm -hmm. it's one of those things where you guys are like, you know, you're creating together. So yeah, whatever that product is it, like that comes out of it, you know, is like, it's cool, especially if you really like it, you know? Yeah. So you'll you'll make friendships out of out of just you know having that like personal time like together just like totally throwing ideas out there you know. So I found yeah like if you want to make music and like music is what you love or any sort of art form at all, if you hang out with a bunch of people who do that too and that's what you guys do for fun and stuff yeah. and they're doing dope stuff you know, 
that's that's how you get the person who gets the call, you know, for something yeah. dope is just being around and just being, you know, in it. Like totally. Even if it's an entry level, you got to start somewhere. But really, the best way is to to get anywhere. I found was like, so like some of like the early stuff I produced, like my friend, like little Zan, you know, who he used to just like take photos at our house, you know, when we were doing studio sessions and stuff like that. And then he just started rapping at our house and then blew up, you know, like came a mainstream artist. Yeah. And that was just because, you know, friends hanging out, you know, just making music together. And one of the dudes happened to like crack, you know, which that'll happen when you're making music all the time with different people and stuff. Your odds get better with someone hitting the mark, you know, and someone going up and then, if you have a part to play in that person's ascension in any way, mm -hmm. uh, you'll get risen up a bit with it, you know, like the kind of like high tide lifts all boats thing, you know, especially yeah. if you're right next to it, like it's gonna, and then when you're around, then you'll kind of see, you know, you'll get like the, the aerial view of like music and just like, oh, wow, this is, this is how this is done, you know, like at like this level, you know, you get more of an insight on how things really work and how blowing up an artist works and yeah. you know just then essentially you're just doing educated guesses after that trying to make it happen again but yeah. um yeah just having friends who are just like trying to make music too is or whatever if you're a photographer or it's better too if like you're a musician friends with videographers photographers yeah like dudes who have different skill sets in other um artistic places because then you're like a fool you're a force you know yeah uh, for real. You have like a whole thing going. It's a whole thing. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to end the podcast with a quote from you. Let's and uh, and uh, this ties in what we've been talking about the whole time. Coming up with simple stuff is is, is the hardest thing to do. And you said, uh, work hard, stay busy. Yeah. <laughs> work hard and stay busy. Just keep your head down. You know, just keep going. There's no, I feel like there's just no... No reason to quit, you know, like if, if yeah. you like making music, say your first band doesn't work out or you have some sort of project fail and like doesn't get where you want it to get. That just can be one chapter in music. You know, you can still have a normal job, make music for fun yeah. and get past zero. So if you just don't give up, I would say just add that like, yeah, work hard, stay busy, don't give up. Like that's the the trifecta for that's the trifecta of a life, dude. I guess so. Of, of being having a a career, and I think anything really, essentially. Yeah, it's just, that's the best best shot. You know, it's not going to work for everyone all the time, obviously. But uh, you know, if if you want to play your cards smart, you know, just get as good as you can at what you do. Have fun doing it, so you enjoy doing it. You do it more often, and yeah, like you know, don't don't get discouraged because something doesn't work out the first time just keep going at it hopefully i'll be like you know 80 still making beats on my like lifer futuristic like you know look at you you're, you're bad you're a fucking lifer oh i have no choice for sure <laughs> look at us dude no choice yeah no choice we are a we're bunch of freaks dude. we are not going anywhere no i was <laughs> dude it's funny because i had a normal job once in high school i did like uh same I did projection for a movie theater and then I've just like engineered bands and produced uh, music since then. So yeah. I think I'll be all right. You know, <laughs> Boom. Well, we, we got the trifecta. Yeah, that's man. it. Dude, thanks so much for having me. Anytime, man. Where, uh, where can people find you? Um, you can just follow me on, you know, all, all the social medias, the uh, Instagram, Morgoth Beats, Beats with the Z at the end, M-O-R-G-O-T-H-B-E-A-T-Z. Follow me, TikTok, uh, Twitter, Instagram, all that, you know, just uh, post stuff of lots of be lots of me making music. That's really what it is. Cool. Well, great, great seeing you, man. It was an honor. Yeah, dude, so cool to be back here. Thank Hell you so yeah. much for having me. Anytime. All right, everybody, that's it. Later.